Okay, this is the chapter nine scribbly notes. Chapter nine is sinusoids and phasers. And I'm just gonna go through these notes and talk about them. So these are posted. So we have a sinusoidal signal, but we use cosine, but we say sinusoidal. But uh, yeah, so here's a typical signal. This is a current signal as a function of time. And it's just a, um, you know, a regular, simple uh, cosine function. So you have I sub m, which is the maximum current value, cosine omega t plus um, phi. And this, uh, so omega t, omega is the angular frequency in radians per second. So times time, you're going to get radians. So this thing here, um, you know, if omega is in radians, you need to make sure that phi is in is in radians. But often radians is or often phi is given in degrees. So you have to make sure you translate. Do the same. Make sure they're the same units for your calculator. So for chapter nine, we're talking about steady state sinusoidal signals. So for that, omega, the angular frequency, is constant. Okay, that's very important. Phasers only work when omega is constant. And all the signals, all the voltage and current signals and will have the same omega. Okay, and it's related to the speed of, of a rotating machine, like a generator or, or a motor. Um, so here's what that signal here, this mathematical expression, here's what it might look like if you graphed it. And um, I sub m is the peak value, right? Measured up, right? So from peak to peak, it's gonna be two times I sub m. And this uh, phase, this phase angle here, theta, or phi, sorry, I mix up theta and phi sometimes. This this here is um, the phase shift. That's um, if you're doing plus phi, then it'll it'll move the 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 peak here, you know, backwards in time. And if you if we're plotting this on the time axis, we need to um, divide by omega to get seconds, right? Because this is this is given in. If this is given in radians, for example, you need to divide by radians per second to get seconds. Um, okay, then T is the period, right? It's the time that it takes for the cycle to complete or peak to peak time. And just to remind you, um, some, some stuff from trig, uh, the frequency is uh, one over the period, right? and the units of frequency are radians per second, or sometimes cycles per second, if that's more convenient. Or we also refer to that as hertz. And uh, let's see. The angular frequency omega is 2 pi times the, frequ the uh, frequency. So it ha has radians, radians per second. Or it's also omega is also equal to two pi over over the period, and there's some conversion factors that come up. This is just straight, pretty much straight review of trig. But uh, remember, there's pi radians per 180 degrees. If you need to convert between radians and degrees, or the other way around, and uh, there's two pi radians in a cycle, right? As it goes from all the way from the one peak to the next, it's traveling through two pi in one cycle. Just trig stuff. Let's see. Um, so there's this peak value here, I sub m, and um, there's that. So that's peak, but sometimes we're given an RMS value, root mean square value, and there's a reason for that that we'll talk about later. But sometimes you're just given the I value as RMS, so you need to convert to the peak uh, by dividing by root two. Um, yeah, so that's kind of a basic review of, of, of trig. So this, this brings us to 
to phasers. I'm missing a page here. This is a called a, often called a time domain signal. So we 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 have i of t or you know the current as a function of time. Um, the thing is, we know that for a steady state sinusoidal signal, we know that all the signals are going to have the same omega, and what the way it's going to turn out is that they're only going to all these signals are only going to differ by the phase angle and the uh, amplitude. That's it. The they all have the same omega, and they'll just have a different phase angle and a different amplitude. So instead of dealing with all of this trig and having to do math in the time domain, what we have is something called phasers. So what we're going to do is we're going to transform time domain signals, these I of T, V of T kinds of signals, into frequency domain signals known as phasers. And um, a phaser is, is basically a complex number that contains this amplitude and phase angle information that we're, we're interested in, because we know the rest. We know that it's going to be a cosine function, and if we ever need to go back to time domain, we can. What we're mostly in interested in is just the amplitude and the phase angle, um, because the signals all have the same frequency. So for example, here's the time domain signal. Voltage is a function of time. This has a peak value of 100, and it has a phase shift of... 30 degrees. And so we can just sort of capture this, this, these two pieces of information, the peak and the phase angle, and, and write it as a phaser. So 100 angle, pos positive 30. We, that's how you say that. So V phaser, this bar on the top is the way you would write it with a pencil, or the book has uses bold font, but you could also write a bar on top if you don't have a if you can't write bold font with a pencil, which you can't really. Anyway, magnitude and, and phase angle. So V phaser equals 100 angle 30. This is the frequency domain. So we have time domain signal, and we've turned it into a frequency domain signal. Now, frequency domain signals have two forms. They either have a rectangular form or a polar form. This is a polar form because you're, you're, you're recording the amplitude or, and the phase angle. But you can also convert that to a rectangular form using right triangles. So this particular phaser has an amplitude of 100 and an angle of 30. So here's 100 on the hypotenuse, okay? And then the angle is 30 degrees. You draw a little triangle like that. And then just by trig, these guys here, which are like the, like the only trig functions that I actually remember, is, is x is r cosine theta, given this little right triangle, you know, where r is the hypotenuse, and you've got a angle in here. And, and it's a right triangle, 90 degrees over here, and then uh, 5 degrees over here. So R equals cosine theta. I'm mixing up theta and phi again, I know. but And Y is, is R sine theta, and then R is arc tangent of Y over X. So anyway, this 86 here is 100, 100 cosine theta, and uh, 50 is 100 sine theta. Uh, so V phaser is 86.6 plus J 50, where J is the square root of minus 1. So this is rectangular form of a phaser, this thing. And this is polar form of a phaser. And all of this magic comes from Euler's identity and a whole bunch of derivation that's in the text and in your math classes. Wonderful stuff, but we're just going to use it as a tool here. So we'll go from time domain to frequency domain and back again. And then sometimes when we're, when we're in frequency domain, we'll need to switch between polar form and rectangular form. So this can be done manually using these, these trig functions and right triangles. But you really need to be able to do it on your calculator, it's not just for the homework, but especially for the exam. And because we're going to be writing simultaneous equations with phasers in them and it's just it's just way too much manipulation to be able to to, to convert between uh, between these guys between polar and rectangular my calculator has a button I just I can enter 
rectangular and press a button and it'll, and it'll give me polar and, and vice versa. All right, so it's the basic idea of time domain and uh, phasor domain or frequency domain. Um, what about the elements that we're going to deal with? We're dealing with three elements, right? Uh, resistors, capacitors, inductors. So in the time domain, what we've been doing so far has been time domain. We have resistors, inductors, and capacitors, and we have these function, these, uh, uh, these relationships or these rules. We have Ohm's law v equals IR, and we have I in a current in a cap, cap is capacitor times v prime, and the voltage in an inductor is L I prime, and um, in the frequency domain, we're going to be dealing with impedance, right? Instead of having to deal with re resistance, inductance, and capacitance kind of separately with a whole lot of time domain math, we're just going to deal with this quantity called impedance, where V phasor on voltage phasor is current phasor um, Z. And this should be a phasor. Looks like I had it erased, but it should be a phasor. Um, so this is like Ohm's law for steady state sinusoidal circuits. Steady state sinusoidal or SSS, steady state sinusoidal, right? So we just have Ohm's law. Instead of having to deal with derivatives and all kinds of math, we can just use Ohm's law. So it's, it's pretty cool. So what are the current voltage relationships, right? What are the voltage voltage current relationships for these three elements. So you got a resistor, you just got this Ohm's law, and in here it will R will just be a scalar, right? For um, for a purely resistive circuit, the impedance is the impedance Z is just R. Okay, for a fully um, a purely resistive circuit. So let's see, here's the diagram. You've got a resistor with resistance R. You've got I phasor going through it. So I is a, a sinusoidal signal with a certain amplitude and a certain phase shift. And V is a sinusoidal signal with a certain amplitude and a certain phase shift. And if the, if the um, you know, we're case, in the case of a resistor, purely resistant, resistive, this will be a scalar. Z is R, and they, uh, the current and the voltage will be in phase here. So they'll, they'll line up, they'll be in phase with each other, and they'll only differ by their, um, by their amplitudes. Okay? Uh, from the case of an inductor, the, um, you gotta use the full expression, this should be, uh, this should be a phasor again. I don't know why I'm taking off these phasor arrows in here. But so voltage is just uh, zi. This is the Ohm's law for phasors, and z is given by this j omega l thing, where j is the square root of minus one, and omega l is called the reactance x. Okay, so there's reactance x omega l, and then impedance is when you throw J on the front, you get impedance. For this situation, the voltage will lead the current by 90 degrees. So the signals will look like this. The, the current will be somewhere, and the voltage will be 90 degrees in front of that. So a quarter of a, of a cycle in, in front of that, or pi by two radians um, in front of that, because it's two pi per a cycle. So pi by two is a, a quarter of a cycle. It'll, the voltage will lead the current by exactly 90 degrees. And there's this little Eli way to remember that, ELI, or f which means if it's an inductive circuit, E is the voltage. Energy, okay, is kind of how you remember. The voltage will be ahead of the current for an inductive circuit. Eli, the Iceman, and uh, that's where it comes from. This thing called Eli, the Iceman. Man.
where for an inductive circuit, the voltage will lead the current, and for a capacitive circuit, the current will lead the voltage. So here's a capacitive circuit, and here the current leads the voltage by 90 degrees, ICE. ICE is a mnemonic. It's a way to remember something. Just a way to remember that for a capacitive circuit, the current will be ahead of the voltage, and, and as, as seen here, so um, the voltage will be somewhere, and the current will be 90 degrees exactly ahead of the voltage, if it's purely a capacitive circuit. And for a capacitive circuit, the impedance Z will be given by J times the reactance X, and the, react the reactance is minus 1 over uh, omega C. Okay, so yeah, so let's work. Let's work a couple of simple, uh, simple problems here, just to kind of review the trig and such. So um, yeah, here's a. This is just a, a sinusoidal time domain signal. It's really a review of trig and, okay, just to get you working with frequencies and periods and all of this stuff that you may not have had for a while in your math class since, since you took your math class. All right, so say you're given a sinusoidal current with a maximum amplitude of 20 amps and one cycle takes one millisecond. So they're telling you the period is, is one millisecond. And then they're telling you the phase shift sort of indirectly by telling you that the current will be 10 amps, right? So it's let, the peak is 20, but it'll be 10 at t equals zero. So when the signal crosses the y-axis, it'll be 10. So find this stuff. Find the frequency in hertz. Find omega in radians per second. What is I of t? Okay, using cosine and theta. So what's the time domain signal for I of T, given this information up in here? Then what's the RMS value? Just throw root 2 in there and then plot it. So it told you the period here that by saying one cycle is one millisecond. So that's T, it's one millisecond. So we, we know from trig that the frequency is 1 over the period. So it's 1 over 0.001 is 1,000 hertz, right? 1,000 cycles in a second, right? If it's one millisecond per cycle, thousand cycles per second, then you have this other trig thing where omega is two pi f. So two pi times a thousand is two two thousand pi radians per second. Or if you don't want to write, have the pi symbol in there, you could multiply times three point one four or one five nine two seven, and you get two six eighty radians per second. So the time domain signal is. Generally speaking, the formulas of a time domain signal would be, um, in the case of I as a function of time, would be the peak value I sub m times cosine omega t plus phi. And so it's um, uh, I sub t is 20 cosine 2000 pi t plus phi. And we don't know phi, but uh, we can solve for that because we know that it's 10. It's given that the current is 10 amps when the time is zero. So plug in zero for the time and plug in uh, this expression equal to 10, right? The only unknown here uh, is, is, uh, is phi. Is that theta or phi? I gotta go look that up. I'm gonna stop the video and look that up. It's phi. All right, um, yeah, so bring the 20 over, it's one half, take the arc cosine of both sides, arc cosine of a half is 60 degrees, so phi is 60. And what else is happening here? So that's our I of T is 20, cosine omega is 2000 pi T plus Phi is 60. When you plot this thing, which they're asking you to do, and I would like you to do from now on, plot any signal that is changing over time, please, on your homework. So it looks like that, and it's shifted here by 
phi by omega. Well, we're plotting this on the time domain, so we want to know what is this this time here. And uh, you can figure that out here by uh, phi is 60 degrees, convert to radians by using this pi by 1 dd conversion factor. So it's 1.05 radians. Convert that to time by dividing by omega. So 1.05 over 2,000 pi omega is 2,000 pi. So it's going to be um, 17 milliseconds. So I've marked it here. Uh, this thing is peaks. This thing, this signal peaks at, you know, 0.17 milliseconds before, you know, zero. So minus 0.17 milliseconds. And let's see, the last thing they're asking for is the RMS value. And that is just apply this, apply this formula here. The RMS value is root two less than the peak. So it's going to be 14.4 amps. Okay, that's just a simple problem where we're going through just trig, just to help you remember all of these, you know, all of these things from trig that we don't necessarily do all the time in regular life when you're just kind of walking down the street being a human. So another problem here, uh, let's do some phasor transforms. So most... What we're going to do, we're going to start off in the time domain, convert to the frequency domain, work some problems using all our methodologies that we've learned so far, you know, voltage division, current division, node voltage, mesh current, all kinds of uh, other methods like that. And then we're going to, con we might convert back to time domain. So here's a time domain signal and it's frequency domain equivalent. So you just take the peak, 170, put that there, and then uh, the phase angle. So you say V phaser is 170 angle minus 40 volts, All right? They might give you a sine function instead of a cosine function. So you gotta convert sine to cosine. Remember this thing from trig, that sine is just a cosine shifted by 90 degrees. So, uh, you know, they give you a phase angle of 20 degrees with a sine function. Just, um, just subtract 90 and you get cosine with a minus 70 phase angle. And then you can pull out the 10 and the minus 70 for your I phaser is 10 angle minus 70. Okay. What about this thing here? You're given this two trig you know, two trig, two cosine functions here. So I is five cosine omega T with a phase angle of 36.87 plus 10 cosine omega T plus minus 53.13. So they're both cosines. So we're cool there. We could, we could, you could, you know, like if this were trig class, you would use some identity and try and combine these, but we can turn them into phasers and then combine them. So we have five angle 36.87 right? Just pull the 5 and the 36. Pull the 10 and the 53 out, right? Then, you know, your calculator may be able to add these in polar form. This is polar form right here, right? We're specifying the, the amplitude or the, the hypotenuse, really, of the right, tri right triangle and then the angle. You could do that, and you should make, you should get your calculator to figure out how to, to do these, how to add these in polar form. But just to to work with the math, we could also convert to rectangular form and then add the x and y components, right? So five, here's the triangle, see? Five with an angle of 36.87 looks like this triangle. Five is on the hypotenuse. Um, if you take five cosine 36.87, you get a four. And if you take five sine 36.87, you get a three. So it's a three, four, five triangle. This guy here, or this guy, this 10, 53, there's 10, there's minus 53. These, these two numbers using, using uh, you know, x equals r cosine theta and y equals r sine theta. You get a 6 and an 8. Add those. So add, add the 4 and the 6 gives you a 10, right? The 4 plus 6, those are the, the uh, real parts. And then add the 3 and the and the eight and the minus eight, those are the imaginary parts. So the three and the eight give you a, f a minus five, right? So, uh, and then turn this 10 minus J5 triangle back into a polar form. 
So there's the 10, there's the 5. If you used um, one of these guys, R equals A, arc tangent y over x, you could get the 11.18. Or you could use Pythagoras. You know, 5 squared plus 10 squared, take the root of that. Yeah, anyway, so polar, you know, go from time domain to polar, take polar to rectangular, take the rectangular, add them, then go back to polar. Then we could go back to time domain, right? We could take this polar here, the result, and stick it back in a trig function. There's our 11.18 amplitude, and there's our minus 26 phase shift. Okay? Let's see. One more here. You're given a cosine and a sine. So we got to turn this sine into a cosine. So let's see. The first one's 300 and the 45. You just bring that straight from time domain into frequency domain. The second guy, you got to add or subtract 90. So 30 minus 90 is minus 60. So bring the minus 100 over here, the amplitude, and then bring the, uh, take this 30 and subtract. 90 to turn it into a cosine function. Then um, take these two these two polar guys, turn them, you could turn them into rectangular. You could draw the triangles, but your calculator should be able to, to turn polar into rectangular, as well as add and subtract at least one of these guys. At least should be able to add and subtract rectangular or add and subtract polar. Hopefully it'll do it, all of that and more, but figure that out. Okay, so we go to polar, to rectangular, and then we add the real components, the 212 and the 15, you get this 162, and then you add the imaginary components, 212 and 86, and you get this 298. And you can go back to polar, and here's the matching triangles. So that's the basic idea of, of phasor transforms. We're going to work... We're going to work several problems using voltage division, current division, node voltage method, and mesh current method, and Ohm's law in the phasor domain, and a few other things. Oh yes, there's a little bit more theory. Here it is. So there's transformers, and then house current, so or house power distribution. Okay, so transformers. The first concept with transformers is this turn ratios and the voltage. Okay, so a transformer, you just have two coils of wire with a, usually an iron core surrounding them. So there's a, you can model it as two inductors with these two lines, but really it's two coils of wire, you know, they can be coincidentally wound, you know, kind of wound together with insulation around them. And then... The whole thing can be on a metal core. There's different ways to make transformers, but they're basically inductors, and they have different windings. So that there's a n n one is the number of windings in in this coil, and n two is the number of windings in that coil. And uh, there's a voltage v one and a current i one here, and then there's a voltage v two and a current i two, and then there's these dots. The dots can be you know both up here or both down there or up here and down there and down here and up here kind of thing. So the relation between V1, I1, v V2, I2 is this thing. So V1 over N1 is V2 over N2. So like if you put N1 over here on the other side, you'll get you know V1 is N1 over N2, V2. So if you want to, let's see, if you want to decrease the voltage if you want to make V1 bigger than V2, then you would have to have N2 bigger than N1. And the drop will be you know, directly the direct ratios here. So if you wanted to have the voltage on, on this side, you would put N, you would make N2 have twice the number of windings as N1. And the inverse is true for the current, right? The current will 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 uh will uh you know increase if if you have uh, n2 bigger and then there's a there's a 
negative sign on this guy if the if and, and there isn't here but so basically if the dots agree with if the dots are both at the plus for, for the for the for the uh for the voltage if the dots are at the plus then they'll they'll, they'll this this term will be positive and if if they if they dots aren't um so we call that positive the dots agree if the dots are both at, at the positive terminal we say that the dots agree because the dots agree because they're at the they're both at the positive terminal so if the dots agree then this term will be positive if the dots don't disagree uh, <laughs> rather if the dots disagree you'll have a negative sign out here but and it's the other way around for current if the dots agree that is if the dots are you know here they're at the tails of the currents that is they agree so we, we put a negative sign. Now, if one of these dots was at the head and, and the other one was at the tail of the arrow, right, we would say that the dots disagree with the current and there would it would be a positive sign here. So there's that. Okay, there's just the ratio of the voltages and the currents um, as that relates to the number of windings on either side. There's that. The other thing to keep in mind is the power is the same on both sides neglecting losses now there will be some heat losses in a, in a transformer due to resistance and uh, hysteresis um, and maybe something else some other effects but they're not that the losses the heat losses in a transformer are not that great you know they're i'm guessing but i i'm thinking it's above 80 percent maybe 90 percent efficient Go look at a transformer like on a power pole, and the bigger ones have these radiator things on the side, but the smaller ones don't. So that sort of implies that the smaller ones are able to radiate all their heat just through their the round casing they're in, right? It's not until they start to get pretty big that they need a radiator. Kind of like an elephant, right? An elephant needs big floppy ears to keep cool because he's so big, but a uh, little mouse, you know, doesn't necessarily need the little the floppy ears. Um, so the power is the same. So the power on the left side is V1, I1. And neglecting losses, that the, the power on the right side will be the same as the power on the left. And the power on the right side is V2, I2. Okay, so, vol so transforms are used just to change the voltage-current ratio, but the same amount of power passes through from one side to the other. Neglecting losses, which are somewhat... We are minimal. Okay, that's the first idea with transformers is this turns ratio and then the voltage current power thing. Then there's also impedance matching. Okay, so so we'll talk more about impedance. But basically a load, let's say there's a load on this side, on the right side, with a certain impedance, right? Like in uh, earlier in the book we had resistances over here. And that and the load was a resistance, but now because we're in frequency frequency domain or phasor domain, we we're going to be using impedance z for the load. So there's some z of the load, the impedance of the load on this side. This will have some impedance, but on the on on the left side, let's say you're feeding power into this left side, you know, through a transformer to this load. The impedance seen here. I should draw z sub n. The impedance seen by on the left will be different than the the actual load impedance, and it depends on the load windings here. The derivation of the book is pretty elaborate, but it comes down to this simple one over a squared thing, which is interesting because it's squared, right? Like it, the ratio of the windings here, you know, it, it changes the voltage and current just by the ratio, right? the ratio of the ends, but the impedance is squared. So, you know, they're, they're depending on, so A could be, you know, this is one, one to N, like, um, this could be um, kind of only makes sense if you have one, if A is bigger than one, but mathematically, you know, physically, yeah, if you have one winding here, then you have to have some multiple of one winding on the other side. But mathematically, this could be less than one, you know, 
and um, just physically, you, get, you know, each one, <laughs> one winding would have to have at least one winding on the other side. It couldn't have half a winding, but mathematically, it, it could have half a winding and it'd still work, you know. So what I'm saying is, if it was one to point five, what it, what's really happening is it's two to one. Okay, so anyway, this here could be much, much less or much, much greater, depending on whether this is you know, less than one or not. The A is less than one or not. So, so that's kind of interesting that, you, you know, you're driving through like the power grid. You're driving, you know, you're, you're supplying, uh, you know, power on this side through a bunch of transformers. And it could be stepped up many times and, and down many times to some impedance on the load. The, the impedance seen by here is, is much different than the actual impedance, and we'll look at that. All right, then the last concept is this household power distribution thing. Okay, so what's going on here is we got um, a transformer. Now this is like the transformer that's out in front of your house. If you, if you have telephone poles in your neighborhood, then you can go look up on the pole and see it. If you have buried power lines like they do in uh, a lot of the newer suburbs they're building, you won't see the transformer. But there's a transformer, you know, connected to, to your house. There's a tip, there's, they put some typical values in here for voltages and, and loads. So let's look at them. So the power lines feeding one side of the transformer have a very high voltage. It goes, it can go even higher than this elsewhere in the distribution grid, but but right coming to your house, it's a, this is a reasonable number, 13.2 with an angle of zero degrees kilovolts. So very, very high voltage, dangerous. And this, by the way, which we'll see more in chapter 11, this AB is being fed from two lines, two phases of a three-phase distribution grid, right? The big power lines have three lines if you go out there and look at them. Then they'll run two lines into each neighborhood. And so for example, your neighborhood might have lines A and B and the, dis the difference between A and B is this where this 13.2, the, the, the peak difference here will be this 13.2. And that'll be the reference zero, by the way. It's just a reference. This, this thing, this isn't, it isn't the, whatever, how to say, the actual zero. But this peak will be the reference zero that we're going to use. We'll talk more about that in chapter 11. Anyway, so there's three phases. Two of them feed your house. Okay, and we'll, you know, we're using this reference voltage here. There's a certain number of windings between here. And then there's this weird center tap business coming off here. This is grounded, by the way. So I don't think I don't think I could squeeze that in here and keep it pretty. But the neutral is grounded at the uh, at the transformer and at your house. I know for sure it's grounded at your house. Not I'm not so sure about the transformer thing, but it's uh, it's the same. It's just a line. It, it's a node. Okay, from the transformer to your house is a wire. It has some resistance, but you can neglect it. But it's grounded at your house. Okay, so you've got A and B nodes, little a, little a and little b nodes here from neutral, which is grounded, the center tap, to A. That's 100 and 120 volts with this polarity. And then from neutral to B is this 120 volts with, the, with this polarity relationship. It's, it's minus plus, minus plus. So it's, you know, it's zero volts here because it's grounded. And it's positive 120 here. So it would be plus 120. Okay, it's zero volts here and then it's dropping 120. So it's, it's minus 120 volts here at this, at this node, at little b node. So that means that from this positive 120 to this minus 120 is 240. Okay, so you've got 120 across here from neutral to A, and you've got 120 with the opposite phase from, from neutral to B. So here's A phase, 
and then here here's B phase. It's it's they're 180 degrees out out of phase or from each other, and the peak to peak is 240, and the um, so the max this the uh, maximum here will be 240. The maximum across here will be 120. And let's see, then there's wires. So there's a wire here, there's a wire here, and there's a wire here. They've put low vo low resistance values on that, 1 ohm, 2 ohms, and 1 ohm. That's Because these wires are typically long. You know, they could be several hundred feet in your house. So they have some resistance, but it's not very much. Then let's say it's running a toaster or something. So that could have a 20 amp load. This, this is a toaster. from. So it's your toaster's plugged in from little A phase to, to neutral. This could be another bigger toaster. Or is that a smaller toaster? I guess it's a smaller toaster, higher higher resistance. Anyway, you've got a 20 ohm load with 120 volts. You've got another 40 ohm load with 120 volts. And then you've got a like a big appliance, like an air conditioner or something that has 240 volt uh, supply and a 10 ohm load. Okay, so we'll look at this AB part of it in chapter 11. And in this chapter 9, we'll look at, you know, the right-hand side, the load side of that. All right, we'll work some problems.